Welcome to Business Mentorship, Keeping It Real, where we introduce corporate leaders who have taken the leap to business owner and participate with their great idea in our guest blog found on shareyourstories.online. Our guest joins us from Windsor, Ontario. Karen Tompkins is an author, a speaker, and a specialist in inclusive education. Let's find out how this author of a children's book is using her skills as an actor, a director, and an educator to help others create harmony in both business and life. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome Karen Tompkins. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here as well. You know what I absolutely loved about your story, Karen, is that what started with the children's book has now given you the tools and resources to move forward to helping folks like me find peace and calm in their life. So why don't we start by you giving us a little bit of an overview of what the children's book is about, because the title is really quite intriguing. Different is just different. Well, thank you for asking about the book. It's definitely one of my uh, favorite projects of my life. Um, so our oldest daughter, Erin, uh, was born with a rare disorder. And so she found many things that other people find easy, very frustrating. Uh, she has Joubert syndrome. So she's missing a part of her brain uh, that deals with sensory processing and balance and just overall cognitive uh, function. So when she was around eight years old, she came home from school and she was very upset. And she said, mom, why did God make me different? And I say what we all say to our kids, oh, honey, we're all different. And she said, not like me. And I was like, mm, okay, fair enough. We only know about 200 people in the world that have Joubert syndrome and you are feeling very different. So let's have a good cry about that and see how we can move forward. And that's how the book was born. And so the book itself is just, you know, starts talking about that different is just different. It's, it's not a judgment. It's not a, um, a timeline. It's not anything other than just different. And so by talking about things that are, you know, we use different shoes for different places and different tools for different jobs and then different, uh, you know, people need different ways to communicate. And then it ends with, how are you different? So it's a really good way uh, for anybody to start talking to a young person about differences in a non-judgmental and open way. Now, how I've used that with adults is, is kind of bringing it back to that point. How are we different and how do we help each other be okay with the inclusive things that need to be in place for everyone to reach their full potential? And, you know, that's what I love, because when you're working with teams of individuals and at various different points in times, whether you're an enterprise leader or a small business owner, we're going to encounter not only different personality types and different people in general, mm -hmm. but different skill levels. You know, we, we may be an excellent communicator, but the person that we're speaking to may not be. Or, you know, they may have a skill and you think, wow, geez, you know, I'm not really getting this, you know, that you feel that you're not making that connection. So give us a bit of an indication as to the type of skills that we can use to try to bridge that gap. Because I often find that children's books are actually a wonderful way for adults to make a connection. Because whether you're reading it to, you know, your grandchild or your child, or maybe you've even just come across the book and you read it yourself, mm -hmm. it's a really simplistic and wonderful way of getting across some really meaningful messages. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the key to all of this is, uh, as I've said before, um, education and mm -hmm. communication. Right. Understanding that not all behavior is trying to control you or trying to get something that they want, but rather sometimes it's a reaction to the environment, to something that happened years ago. We know there's quite a bit of connection between past trauma and present behavior and anxiety and its and its partner anger is really just your body's response to unresolved stress 
And I'm pretty sure we all have many yeah. things that are stressful that it is not ours to resolve. And so when you when you see a coworker being frustrated about something and snapping at you, that it's important to breathe. Remember that it's not about you all the time. Sure. Um, but, you know, we, we react to what we see and what we feel and what we hear. So being able to take that step back and say, hold on, let, let's really look at this. Being able to access the things that we know about behavior, like maybe this person is just in fright flight mode for some other reason. And this is how it's expressing itself today. Um, people that need to control their environment are hyper organized. We used to call them type A personalities. Mm -hmm. Those are actually all um, ways that anxiety expresses itself in our life. So being able to pull on those tools of, you know, that you've that you've learned in the past about people's behavior and what it really means to that person and and then being ed and then being able to communicate that with the person and whether that means um taking a moment to say okay i i hear what you're saying can we just breathe about this for a minute and i'm i'm wondering if this is about really about what we just said or something else going on and i don't mean to say that we should all pretend to be psychologists. I don't mean that at all. What I mean is being able to draw attention to the fact that there is more than one reason for overt behavior. Do you think it's empathy? Do you think that is the skill that we need to be able to, because if we're empathetic, we can sometimes recognize other people's frustration. Oh, it's absolutely part. Empathy is absolutely part of it. Um, my my daughter Sarah works uh, with um, people with exceptional learning needs as well, and her mantra is always err on the side of empathy. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you're going to make a decision, make it in their favor. Now, how do we recognize it in ourselves? Because you know, you've made some wonderful points. Every single one of us has stress in our life. For some people, it can be overwhelming. For other people, it's manageable. But I think that we all have that level to kind of flip off the dial, right? Where we sort mm -hmm. of things start to escalate. So, and you've given us one great tip and that's breathe. But how do we recognize that somebody's, there's a trigger there and things are starting to get out of control? Is there, is there a, a body, a mannerism? Is there, is it, you mentioned fight or flight. Is it the fluttering of the heart or that, you know, that feeling in the pit of your stomach that something just doesn't quite feel right? Because I think that's all part of the identification of being able to be empathetic with ourselves. I would absolutely agree with that. And that's an excellent question how, that people have asked before. How do I know that I'm in fright, flight, fight? Mm -hmm. Well, in the moment, you don't. <laughs> because you, when you are in fright, flight, fo fight mode, uh, because of the cortisol increase, because something is stressful, you are not aware of your environment. Your brain is really good at solving the problem and staying focused on that. And that's your neurochemistry at work. And it's not until you get out of the way of that truck that almost hit you that you're suddenly aware of your heart rate and your breathing and the sounds around you. And, you know, even just relating that story to somebody later on gives you that same fright, flight, fight response. But because it was resolved the first time, it's resolved in the story. And so you go back to a homeostasis. Right. So I'm not sure that it's about knowing when I am, but being aware that I can be. And if you know that that is something that happens to you, and your colleague points out, wait a minute, is this really about what we were just talking about and interrupts that, um, that brain flow, then I think that's all part of the being educated and the communicating um, because it will, it will tweak that part of your brain that goes, oh yeah, I do tend to do that, don't I? When you think about a fight, response, uh, especially if somebody's almost getting hit by a big red truck. You know, you 
you know, fight response is I'm going to now beat up the truck that almost hit me. And, you know, you, you laugh about that because it doesn't make any sense, but that's the whole point. Right. Your cognitive brain is not connected right now. Right. It's not something you've chosen to do. So back to the question of how do I know that I'm in fight or fright? I don't at that moment. Right. However, if somebody's able to um, interrupt me in a way that tweaks something that I already know and I already know about myself and I believe to be true, then I can go, oh, right, and we can move on. So how does an individual like yourself, you know, you're an author and you're a speaker, how did you get into this whole idea of sharing these theories and thoughts with audiences from a speaking speaker's point of view? Because I'm sure our viewing and listening audience is saying, okay, she wrote a book. Clearly she's very knowledgeable on the subject matter, but how did you make bridge the gap yourself from going to, you know, sharing the book and the story to getting on a stage and sharing the book and the story? Well, as a teenager, I was already teaching in the summer and I was already on stage whenever I had the opportunity um, in terms of being in musical theater and, and things like that. So as I got older and became a, a, an educator full time in a high school setting, then my daughter was born with this crises and a rare disorder um, diagnosis, it all seemed to come together. And the things that I had learned because I was her mom really clicked with what I knew as an educator. And of course, I was already the kind of person who wanted other people to have the same knowledge that I had gotten in touch with. Mm -hmm. uh, so it started just in my own classrooms, you know, teaching them what I knew. And then from there, it was in my staff room. And then from there, it was around the province through the union. And then when I retired from full-time teaching, then it grew into other stages because, of course, I didn't have to go to the school every day. Okay. So it gives me the freedom to be able to travel and uh, help other people take a look at what, what could be another reason and I, I kind of talk about how life gives us us layers you know uh shrek said that we're onions <laughs> and uh it's true and so every layer of your onion needs a different tool to get through and so we have things like mindfulness and deep breathing mm -hmm. and uh cognitive behavioral therapy but we also have our neurochemistry and i believe and find to be true, that that's the layer that often is the one that we need to be dealing with right now. You know, so if other things have worked in the past, and they're not now, maybe that's what we need to be looking at. So as an entrepreneur, give our viewing and listening an audience an idea of what that feels like because you know you mentioned that you had a, a very successful career in a we'll call it a corporate environment even though it was in the education field and now you've bridged the gap into entrepreneurship how do you find how has that journey been because you know you're you've been in it for a little while now you've got you know you've gotten a little bit of confidence in terms of being your own boss in your own business how do you how is that skill level now changed is there something that you can say wow i really feel that i have to lean into this as an entrepreneur it's frightening That's it really so is um and of course any kind of change is stressful which initiates your fright flight fight response which means you may not be thinking clearly so i've really as you say leaned into um my skill of being open to opportunities, not trying to stick to the path that I decided was going to be the road to success. So what may have worked for other people hasn't worked for me. And what I have found works for me may not work for somebody else. Sure. <laughs> so I think being able to be open with yourself and constantly assessing and reassessing what 
what is my reason? Why am I doing this? Does this fit into that? Or do I need to change my reason? So I've, I flip flopped uh, for the first year or two between do I want to only talk to advocates and parents of people with uh, exceptional needs, or do I want to move into the corporate world? And so at this point, I am making that leap into a more corporate based um, platform. And I've, I've found that the reasons that I hesitated in the past, thinking, well, they won't accept me because I'm just a drama teacher, um, were untrue. Mm -hmm. And and that uh, sometimes we all need a different perspective to be able to really see where we are. Uh, back to that empathy. I'm going to switch our conversation a little bit to the visibility that we all need as entrepreneurs in order to you know be seen, heard, found, and hired, which is the new catchphrase that we're using on the Share Your Stories platform. And I want to reference the photo that you've used in your bio and that you used on our website when you were sharing the story because it is quite an uh, attractive catching photo and for those folks in our viewing and listening audience who perhaps haven't seen it yet you know please visit the web website and go on to Ter karen tomkin's story because basically it's um it's using glasses as an interesting perspective so and I'm sure there's a reason why you chose that particular photo. So give us a little bit of the marketing um, ideas behind that wonderful photo that you used. I'm very much in the web instead of a linear person. And, and I know just from my own marketing experiences for doing theater, you know, getting people to come and see your play, uh, People need to know something about it or have a question about it by the cover. And so by using the glasses, because of course we want to look at our lives through different lenses, I think having the glasses as the focal point before me uh, draws people in, draws people into uh, you know why the glasses and uh, and it just catches your eye because it's not the regular profile picture. You're absolutely right. And I think that that's a really wonderful lesson for those of us who may be looking at a rebranding perspective or, you know, changing our website or, you know, using our marketing materials a little bit differently. It's a really wonderful way to engage your audience to ask more. And I think you've really been able to achieve that with your photo. So kudos to you, because I must admit that the minute I saw the photo, I thought, I have to get this lady on the podcast because that's <laughs> quite an interesting photo. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I'll have to thank uh, Bloom Bear Bloomsbury Photos for right. taking it for me. <laughs> well, they did a great job. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we do in the guest blog is we share three words of advice. Mm -hmm. And as a way to wrap up our conversation today, I'm hoping that you can share with our viewing and listening audience the reason why your three words are important. You've given us an indication of the first one, and that is breathe. And the other two are educate and communicate. Yes, absolutely. I'd love to talk about those things. So breathing, we have so much research about how breathing helps you center, how it helps you refocus. And there's new research with Dr. Lori DeSalta's about uh, the vagal theory and how um, the parasympathetic system responds to deep breathing, which is a calming tool as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to educate yourself about A, yourself, <laughs> but also the others around you uh, for insights of what may be seen on the surface may not be the reality underneath. And then of course, communicating that, um, being able to to positively say to somebody, what? Um, that's not like you. And being able to help them move on from that moment of stress that, that, that they find themselves in. 
Well, I think you've given us some really wonderful things to think about, Karen, in our discussion today. I really love how everything started with the children's book, Different is Just Different, and you've been able to now come up with new and innovative ways to work with a, a B2B or a corporate environment. And we certainly wish you every success in moving forward with that sort of change in dynamic in your revenue stream. And uh, I'm certainly hoping that we'll be able to keep in touch. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a wonderful opportunity. To you, our viewing and listening audience, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this edition of Keeping It Real, where we introduced you to the person behind the logo. If you'd like to connect with our guest, you'll find Karen's contact information in the description portion below. I'm Trish Tonai, author, artist, and the founder and host for the series. And if you're interested in sharing your business story, visit our website at shareyourstories.online and subscribe to our channel, Business Mentorship, Keeping It Real. Thanks again for tuning in and we look forward to meeting you next time when we share another great idea. Thank you.